Hello. This is John T. Rhapsody's Esquire, purveyor of awesome old-school audio stories, bringing you a story today from 1867 by George Washington Harris called Sut Loving Goods Daddy, Acting Horse. George Harris walked the earth, or as Sut would say, the yeath, from 1814 to 1869, mostly in East Tennessee. In 1867, Harris published a book titled Sut Loving Good, Yarn Spun by a Natural Born Dern Fool, containing 24 stories involving his crazy like a fox rural Appalachian character Sut Loving Good who was based on a friend Harris made while surveying copper mines named William Sutt Miller. If you like awesome old-school audio stories from old mines that were once young mines, brought to you free of charge and with a happy and grateful heart, consider while listening to subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications to get notice of new stories. Some funny... Some spooky, all awesome. Usually at least once a week. These simple acts will help this channel immensely. And now, hear the words of old. Sut Loving Goods Daddy, Acting Horse. From 1867 by George Washington Harris. Hold that there horse down to the yeath, or the earth, says one man. He's a-fixin' for the headings, says another. He's a-spreadin' his tail feathers to fly, says another man. Whoa, shave tail, says another. Get a fiddle, he's trying a jig, says one. Say, long legs, raised a power of corn, didn't you, says another. It ain't corn, it's red pepper. These and like expressions were addressed by a group of men sitting at the front of a grocery store to a strange-looking, long-legged, short-bodied, small-headed, white-haired, hog-eyed, funny sort of genius, fresh from some bench-legged clothing store mounted on a horse named Tearpoke. This horse, Tearpoke, was a nick-tailed, bow-necked, Long, poor, pale sorrel horse. Half dandy, half devil, and enveloped in a perfect network of plowing gear. Namely, a bridle, reins, crupper, martingales, straps, and red ferreting. Tearpoke's rider reined up in front of Pat Nash's grocery, among a crowd of mountaineers full of fun, foolery, and mean whiskey. This rider was Sut Loving Good. I say, you darned ash cats, says Sut. Just keep your shirts on, will ya? You never seed a real horse till I rid up. When you took the fuss begrudging look just now at this critter named Tearpoke, you were enjoying a sight of the next to the best horse that ever shelled corn nubbins. The best horse, of course, was my old horse, Tiki Tail, but he's as dead as a still worm, poor old Tiki Tail. Whoa, whoa, Tearpoke, you cussed infernal, fidgety hide full of hellfire, Sut says to the horse. Can't you stand still and listen while I's a polishing your character off as a mortal horse to these here darn fools? Sut's tongue, or his spurs, or both, brought Tearpoke into something like passable quietude while he continued. Say, you, some of you growing hogs made a remark just now about red pepper, says Sut. I just wish to say, in a general way, that any words coupling red pepper and Tearpoke together are darn infernal lies. What killed Tiki Tail, Sut? asked an anxious inquirer after the truth. Why nothing, you cussed fool, says Sut. He just died so, standing up at that. Weren't that real Spanish Castile horse pluck and courageous? You see, he froze stiff. No, not that exactly, but 
starved first, and froze afterwards. So stiff that when Daddy and me went to lay him out and we pushed him over, he stuck out just so. Sut spread his arms and legs to gesture, like unto a carpenter's bench, and we had to wait nine to seventeen days for him to thaw before we could skin him. Skin him? interrupted a rat-faced youth, whittling on a cornstalk. I thought you wanted to lay the horse out. The heck you did, says Sut. Ain't skinning the natural way of laying out a horse, I'd like to know. See here, Sonny. You tell your mama that at the rate you're climbing, you stand a powerful chance to die with your shoes on and get laid out like a horse, you does. The rat-faced youth shut up his whittling knife and subsided. Well, there we were, says Sut, Daddy and me, counting on his fingers, and Sal, and Jake, Fool Jake we called him for short, and Jim, and Phineas, and Calamy Jane, and Charlotte Ann and me, and Zodiac, and uh, Cassius Clay, and Noah Dan Webster, and the twin gals Castor and Pollux, and me, and Catherine the Second, and Cleopatra Antony, and Jane Barnum Lind, and me, and Benton Bullion, and the baby that ain't been named yet, and me, and the prospect, and Mama herself, all left in the woods alone, without a horse to crop with. You counted yourself five times, Mr. Lovingood, said a tomato-faced man in a ragged overcoat. Yeah, old steel tub, that's just the proportion I bears in the family for darn sure. Leaving out daddy, of course. You just let me alone, you cussed fool. Well, anyhow, says Sut, we waited and wished and rested and planned and wished and waited again until nigh unto strawberry time, hoping some stray horse might come along. But dog my cats, if any such good luck ever comes within reach of where daddy is, he's so dodratted mean and lazy and ugly and savage and darn fool to kill any such luck. Well, continued Sut, one night daddy lay awake till cock-crowing time a snoring and a rolling and a blowing, and a shuffling and a scratching itself, and a whispering at mama a heap, and at breakfast I found what it meant. Says daddy, but I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll be the horse myself, and pull the plow whilst you drives me, and then old quilt, that's what he called mama, and the brats can plant and tend. You just let it alone as they darn please. I ain't a carin'. So out we went to the pawpaw thicket, says Sut, and peeled a right smart chance of bark. And Mama and me'd made plowing gears for Daddy out of the bark, while he sat on the fence a-looking at us and studying powerful. Afterwards I found out he was a-studying how to play the character of a horse perfectly. Well, continues Sut, the gears became him mightily and nothing would do him but he must have a bridle, so I got a umbrella brace, which is a little forked piece of square wire about a foot long, like a young pitchfork, you know, and twisted it sort of into a bridle shape. Daddy wanted it made curved, as he hadn't worked for a good while and said he might otherwise go to Raven and Cavortin. When we got the bridle fixed on to Daddy, says Sut, don't you believe he sat into chomping it just like a real horse and tried to bite me on the arm? He always was a most complicated derned old fool, and Mama said so when he weren't around. I put on the plowing gears, and while Mama was a tying the belly band, a straining it powerful tight, Daddy dropped onto his knees and neighed like a mad horse would and slung his hind legs at Mama's head. She stepped back a little, and were standing there with her arms crossed, arresting him on her stomach, and his heel taps come within an inch of her nose. Says Mama, You plays horse better than you does husband. Daddy just ran backwards on all fours and kicked at her again, and pawed the ground with his fists. 
Lead him off to the field, Sut, says Mama, afore he kicks or bites somebody. I shouldered the gopher plow, says Sut, and took hold of the bridle. Daddy leaned back sulky till I said cluck cluck with my tongue, and then he started. When we come to the fence, I let down the gap, and it made Daddy mad. He wanted to jump it on all fours like a horse. Oh, Jiminy, what a derned old fool can come to if he gins up to the complaint. I hitched him to the gopher plow, a watching him powerful close, for I'd seen how quick he could drop onto his hands and kick, and away he went, Daddy leaning forward to his pulling, and we made right pert plowing, even though we had a green horse and plowing gears made a bark. He went over the sprouts and bushes, same as a real horse, only he traveled on two legs. I were mightily hoping about some corn. I could imagine seeing it a-coming up. But there's a heap o' whiskey split twixt the counter and the mouth, and it ain't got but two foot to travel. About the time Daddy were beginning to break a sweat, continued Sut, we come to a sassafras bush, and to keep up his character as a horse, Daddy bulged square into it and threw it, tearing down a ball hornet's nest nigh onto as big as a horse's head, and the whole tribe of hornets covered him as quick as you could cover a sick pup with a saddle blanket. Daddy lit onto his hands again, says Sut, and kicked straight up once, and then he reared and fotched a squeal and sat into straight running away just as natural as you ever seed any other scared horse do. I let go of the line and hollered, Whoa, Daddy, whoa! But you might just as well say whoa to a locomotive. Gee Willitons, says Sut, how Daddy ran. When he came to bushes, he'd clear the top of them with a squeal, gopher plow and all. Perhaps he thought there might be another settlement of ball hornets there, and it were safer to go over than through, and quicker done anyhow. Every now and then he'd fan the side of his head, first with one foreleg and then the other. Then he'd give himself a round-handed slap that sounded like a wagon whip onto the place that the breech bands touches a horse, a running all the time and a carrying that there gopher plow just about as fast and high from the yeath as ever any gopher plow were carried, I'll swear. When he come to the fence, says Sut, he just tore through it, busting and scattering nine to seven panels with lots of broken rails. Right here he left the gopher plow, the gears, the cleaves, and the swingle tress, in other words, all the plowing gear, all mixed up and not worth a dern. Most of his shirt stayed onto the end of a rail of the plow, and now onto a pint of hornet stopped there a stinging all over. Its smell fooled them. The balance of the hornets, now onto a gallon, kept on with Daddy. He seemed to run just exactly as fast as a hornet could fly. It were the tightest race I ever seed for one horse to get all the whipping. Down through a sage field they all went, says Sut. The hornets making it look like there were smoke round Daddy's bald head, and he with nothing on the green yeath in the way of clothes about him, but the bridle, and now onto a yard of plow line sailing behind him, with a tired out hornet riding on the point of it. I see that Daddy were aiming for the swimming hole in the creek, where the bluff is over 25 foot perpendicular to the water, and hits down to 10 foot deep. Well, says Sut, to keep up his character as a horse, plumb through. When Daddy got to the bluff, he leaped off, or rather just kept on running. Kerslunch into the creek he went. I seed the water fly plumb above the bluff from where I were. Now right there, boys, says Sut, Daddy overdid the thing, if acting a horse to the scribe were what he were after. For there's nary a horse folded, darn fool enough to leap over any such place. 
A cussed mule might have done it, but Daddy weren't acting like a mule, though he ought to have took that character instead. It's exactly suited to his disposition, all but not breeding. Note, mules are sterile and cannot propagate. I crept up to the edge of the bluff and peeped over. There were Daddy's bald head for all the yeet like a peeled onion, a bobbing up and down and around, and the hornets sailing round turkey buzzard fashion, and every once in a while one, and sometimes ten, would take a dip at Daddy's bald head. He kept up a rat part, dodging under the water, sometimes afore they hit him, and sometimes afterward, and the water were covered with drowned ball hornets. To look at it from the top of the bluff, it were powerful interesting and sort of funny. I were on the bluff myself, mind you. Daddy couldn't see the funny part from where he were, but it seemed to be interesting to him from the attention he were paying to the business of diving and cussing. Says I, Daddy, if you's done washing yourself and is drunk enough, let's go back to your plowing. It'll soon be powerful hot. Hot nothing, says Daddy. It's hot right now. Don't, and yonder he dipped his head under the water, dodging hornets. You see, dip, these cussed, dip, infernal, dip, varmints after me. What, says I. Them are horse flies there. That's natural, Daddy. You are playing horse. You ain't really feared of them, is you? Horse flies? Hell fire and dip. Darn nation, says Daddy. They's real genuine, dip, ball hornets. Dip, you infernal ignorant cuss. Kick em, bite em, paw em. Switch em with your tail, Daddy, says I. Oh, sonny, sonny, dip. How I'll whip your dip when these dip hornets leave here. You'd better do the leaving yourself, Daddy, says I. Leave here? You darn fool. How dip can I leave dip when they won't dip? Let me stay atop dip the water even. Well, Daddy, says I, you'll have to stay there till night, and after they goes home to roost, you can come home. I'll have your feed in the trough ready. You won't need any currying or brushing tonight, will you? I wish, dip, I may never, dip, see tomorrow. If I, dip, don't make hamstrings, Dip out of your hide, dip, when I does get out of here, says Daddy. It'd be better if you wish you may never see another ball hornet, if you ever play horse again, says I. Them words touched Daddy to the heart, and I felt they must be my last, knowing Daddy's unmollified and angry nature. I broke from them parts, and sort of come over here to the copper mines. When I got to the house, Mama asked me, Where's your daddy? Oh, he turned darn fool and run away, busted everything all to cussed smash, and is in the swimming hole a diving after minutes. Look out, Mama. He'll come home with the angel of death's temper. Better send for some strong man body to keep him from hugging you to death. Lord's sake, said Mama. I knowed he couldn't act like a horse for ten minutes without acting infernal fool to save his life. Well, I stayed hit out until the next afternoon, and I seed a feller a-traveling. Says I, how do you do, mister? What were a-going on at the cabin, this side of the creek, when you passed there? Oh, nothing much, says he. Only a powerful fat man were lying in the yard onto his belly, with no shirt on, and a woman were a-greasing over his shoulders and arms out of a gourd. A powerful, curious, vicious, scary-looking cuss he is, to be sure. His head was as big as a washpot, 
and he hasn't the first darn sign of an eye, just two black slits. His face was all swole up. Is there much smallpox round here? Small heck, says I. No, sir. Been much fighting in this neighborhood lately, says he. None worth speaking of, says I. The traveler scratched his head and says, No French measles? No, sir, says I. Well, says the traveler, do you know what ails that man back there? I says, just getting over a violent attack a darn fool. Well, who is he anyhow, says the traveler. I rose to my feet, stretched out my arms and says, Stranger, that man is my daddy. He looked at my legs and bare feet a moment and said, Yep, darn if he ain't. Now, boys, says Sut to the gentleman at the grocery store, listening to the story. I ain't seen my daddy since, and I don't have much appetite to see him for some time to come. Let's all drink. Here's luck to the darned old fool, and the hornets too. And that concludes George Washington Harris's 1867 story called Sut Loving Goods Daddy, Acting Horse. This is John T. Rhapsody's Esquire, purveyor of awesome old-school audio stories. Thank you for listening. You can hear more stories like this in the channel's playlists. Find them by staying tuned for the last 20 seconds of this video and clicking on the in-screen icons. You can also go to the channel homepage and click on the playlist tab. If you enjoyed this story, and would like to hear more, please help me earn the warm embrace of Mr. and Mrs. YouTubes who look with loving favor upon those channels whose listeners faithfully subscribe, like, comment, click the notification bell, and share the videos with their friends so that they too can hear the words of old.